Welcome to week eight of the course. This is the final week of the course. Thanks everyone for uh, making it along this far and for the great uh, participation in this course. The uh, paper revisions will be due at the end of this week. That will be the last assignment. This week I'm going to be talking about what happens after publication. So after you get papers published in the literature, you may be asked to do peer review, and you may also talk to uh, uh, end up talking to a journalist, to the media, or to the lay public. So I'm going to talk about those things this week. I'll also do some more demo edits to review the concepts that we talked about in the first four weeks of this course. So in this first module, I'm going to talk about how to do a peer review. So uh, a couple weeks ago, we talked about uh, having a peer review done, participating in peer review on the other side as an author. Today I'm going to give you a few tips about what to do if you are the peer reviewer. So uh, after you get a paper or two published in the literature, particularly if you're a first author, very soon after that you may get asked to do peer review. And the first time you're asked, you may feel a little bit intimidated. You may feel like, oh, I'm, I'm too inexperienced. Uh, you know, I don't have enough knowledge of the field. I'm just a graduate student. Uh, but if you get asked to do peer review, you should absolutely take uh, advantage of that opportunity. Journal editors are actually looking for young reviewers. So young reviewers often are more up on the latest uh, in, uh, in a field, on the latest techniques. So they tend to be more informed. Uh, young reviewers also often tend to do a more careful job than people who have been reviewing for a really long time. So there was a paper, uh, a, a research uh, study done that was presented at a conference a few years back where they traced the, the natural history of peer reviewers and they found that you know the longer people had been peer reviewing, the, the more poorly they did the peer reviews. They kind of there was a deterioration effect because the more you do, you know, the faster you get, the less careful you are. So editors really like uh, young reviewers. And it's a great opportunity for you if you get a chance to do a peer review. It's a great learning opportunity. So when you do a peer review, you will see kind of the back end of the publication process. So you're going to learn a lot just by doing that peer review. It's also great for your confidence because if you do a couple of peer reviews, you'll realize that not everything that uh, gets submitted to journals on the first pass is always that great. You'll kind of feel confident because you'll say, "Oh, well, I can do as I can do a paper a as good as that." So you'll I, it usually helps to build your confidence a little bit to just see what's out there. You also get uh, to the practice of kind of going through a paper carefully and thinking about all of the elements that you're looking for in a paper. That helps you when you go back to write your own paper. You'll also get the opportunity to see the reviews that other peer reviewers turn in. And that's also helpful for your confidence because, again, if you're kind of a young reviewer and you're not that confident that you really know how to critique a paper, when you get the other peer reviewers' comments back and you see that they had the same critiques as you, you kind of feel more confident, like, oh, yeah, I do really understand what the limitations of the different study designs are. You really build some confidence. Also, you'll, you'll learn from the other reviewers' comments because sometimes they may have seen something in the paper that you did not see. So it's a way for you to kind of learn, again, how to review a paper and also how to write a paper. So it's a really great learning opportunity. And the more peer, peer reviewers reviews you do, uh, the more you'll learn. So, so take advantage. And again, usually you'll get the opportunity pretty early on in your career. So if you're a peer reviewer, couple of things to keep in mind. So the first thing I always like to talk about with peer review is the tone of your review. So in general, when you're doing a peer review, you are looking for, you tend to be looking for the negatives. I mean, that, you're supposed to be looking for both the positives and the negatives, but because you have to make a judgment on the paper, it's sort of our natural tendency to be looking for all of the negatives. And that's fine. You're supposed to be finding and identifying the problems in the paper. That's a really important job of a peer reviewer. But you have to keep in mind that even though you're being critical of the paper, you can give that criticism in a way that is positive, right? You can give constructive criticism. It doesn't have to be negative. So you have to think very carefully about your tone. And I always like to kind of picture that on the other end of this whole review process, there's some poor graduate student who, you know, is usually the one who did all the works, so the first author on the paper. And just think about that, like, their confidence 
depends on your critique. If, if you give them the same critique in a very harsh way, it can really cripple their confidence. If you give them uh, a critique in a much more positive light with the same criticisms, but just in a much more positive tone, it can be really helpful to their confidence. So really keep in mind that tone really, really matters when you're delivering a critique. So think about that very carefully. Always make sure that you're including positives. There's always positives in every paper. Make sure you're pointing those out. Keep your tone as positive as possible when you're delivering the criticisms as well. So for example, you could say something like, the author should delete table five. Not only is it completely irrelevant, but it also reveals their utter lack of statistical understanding, right? That's a very harsh way of delivering a criticism. Compare that to table five contains unnecessary information. For example, let me give you a specific, and a Pearson's correlation coefficient may not be appropriate here. The author should consider revising or omitting the table. So notice how very different, those are actually the same criticisms, but they're couched in a very different tone. So of course we always want to shoot for that second way of presenting things. Notice that that second way focuses not on the authors, doesn't critique the authors, but it focuses on the table and the specific issues in the table. So you want to just really consider your tone. When you uh, first write a peer review, when you first start to criticize the paper, there's just a natural tendency to, to, to go after saying the authors did this, the authors did that. You have to go back and kind of revise it a little bit to make sure that your tone is positive and that you're critiquing the work and not critiquing the author. So really think about that. We're not critiquing the authors, we're critiquing the work. And so you want to keep things focused on this is the problem with the table, not this is the problem with the authors. Uh, avoid generalizations. It doesn't really help to be uh, overly general with your criticisms. You need to point out very specific errors, otherwise it's not helpful to the authors. It's not constructive criticism. And again, use positive instead of negative language. So instead of saying like the paper is poorly written, you can say the writing and presentation could be improved. For example, example, let me give you a specific area where it can be improved. So be constructive, be as positive as you possibly can. Um, the other thing is, uh, Avoid lecturing to the authors. I have a tendency to do this because I do a lot of lecturing, so I naturally want to say, well, oh, I'm going to teach the author something about statistics, or I'm going to teach them how to write, you know, and that's really not the purpose of peer review, so also avoid lecturing to the authors. It can seem uh, also uh, condescending if you lecture to them, so avoid that as well. Now, just to point out, there's different types of peer review that you might encounter. The most common type of peer review is the single blind peer review. So this is where the authors are blinded to the reviewers. So the authors will not know who reviewed their paper, uh, but the reviewers will know who the authors are on the paper. That's the most common type. You also can sometimes encounter the double blind review. So in this case, the authors won't know who the reviewers are, and the reviewers are also blinded to the authors. So the editors of that journal will go through and actually black out the author's names, they'll remove the title page, they'll black out the institution if that uh, appears anywhere in the paper, so they'll really make an effort to keep the reviewers blinded to the authors. Now it's an imperfect system because I do uh, review for a journal where uh, it, I, I'm blinded to the authors. If I really, really wanted to know who the authors were, though, it probably wouldn't be that hard for me to figure it out just because, you know, it's publication history, right? Certain people are publishing on certain topics and usually, I mean, you could figure it out if you were really trying hard enough, but, but at least by removing the immediate information, usually I have no interest in going to figure out who those authors are. It doesn't matter to me anyway, but, you know, there's some attempt to keep it as unbiased as possible. Now, Something that's changing in the peer review process is there's a move towards more and more journals are starting to offer open peer review. And so this hasn't been um, used very heavily in the past, but I think that's going to change going forward. In open peer review, nobody is blinded. So the reviewer knows who the authors are and the authors know who the reviewer is. And in a lot of cases, the reviewer's name and potentially the whole text of their review may be made publicly available. And I recently had the experience of doing one of these fully open reviews where my review is going to be publicly available. So that's a very different experience because if you as the reviewer know that your uh, critique is going to be published online, you tend, that tends to make you be more constructive and more positive, right? Because you don't want to come across as being this, you know, uh, reviewer who is overly negative and mean. Um, so, uh, so there's a lot of uh, upsides, I think, to an open review like that because it does force you to think about tone and, and to be as constructive as possible. Um, so there's a movement towards that that you should be aware of. 
There's also something called post-publication peer review, which is not what I'm talking about today. But just be aware that, you know, as more and more things go online, there's a lot of peer review that happens after the paper's already been published. So people are commenting online or on blogs, and, and this is a way of vetting papers that got through the peer review system but might have problems in them. And there really is a movement to make more formal systems for post-publication. So that may be coming along soon, so just pay attention to that as a way to, of quality control of the literature. So how do I approach uh, a peer review? When I've got a peer review to do, what's my general process? I'm just going to walk you through some steps. So this is my system, and you'll develop your own system, but just to kind of show you how I would approach it. So the first thing I do, of course, is scan the abstract just to get a sense of what the paper is about. I like to then jump right to the data, to the tables and figures. So I like to see the tables and figures first because to me that's the story of the paper and I want to kind of make my own judgment on the data before I read the author's take on the data. So I will jump to the tables and figures. I'll kind of draw my own conclusions from the data. Remember tables and figures are supposed to stand on their own so if they don't that tells you that that's a big flaw in the paper. Uh, if there's any obvious statistical errors, those might jump out if you're just looking at the data, the tables and figures. So I look at those first. Uh, you might notice if there's repetitive information, like if the same information is in a table and also in a figure, you might pick that up at that point. So that's kind of big picture though. I look at the tables and figures to get some big picture conclusions. Then I'll read the paper through uh, quickly, just to kind of get a sense of exactly what the authors think. And I'll make some kind of high level assessment of the paper. Not, not nitpicky things, but just at a big level, ask myself questions like, Does the, uh, do the author's conclusions match their data? So this is something for me that a lot of papers fall down on. I've looked at the data in the tables, and sometimes when I jump in, then kind of skim through and read the paper through once, Quickly, I'll go, well, they don't, they're kind of overreaching from their data. So that's a common sort of big picture comment I'll have is that they've really overstepped their data. Uh, another uh, kind of general comment that I'll often have um, sort of at the high level in evaluating papers is sometimes there are papers that are just so poorly written that I have to struggle through them and I really can't exactly understand what it is that the authors did. So remember, the paper should be clearly written. If you had to struggle through it, that's not, uh, that's not a fault of, of you as the, as the reviewer, as the reader. That's a fault of the author. The author needs to um, then spend some time to rewrite that paper. Or if the paper is just completely non-understandable, then you're, uh, you might go back to the editor and say, it's just so poorly written, I can't uh, recommend it for publication. So you really shouldn't have to struggle through. And um, uh, that's a common comment I'll make uh, is if the paper is not, not clearly written. Another thing I like to think about in, in my reviews is whether or not the length of the paper is justified given the amount of new information in the paper. So my rule of thumb is that sometimes there are small, interesting data sets that, that do deserve to be published. They do deserve to be in the literature, but because maybe they're of a, the, the methodology is limited and the, new, the amount of novel data they're adding to the literature is limited, I will say, well, this doesn't deserve to be a 20-page paper. It's really interesting. It's, uh, but it's small, it's a small thing, and it probably is, should be a two-page paper. So I often will go back uh, in a peer review and say, well, I don't think this should be so long. I think this should be a much shorter paper. And that's a common um, critique that I might give it sort of at a big level, high level. So if it's a great, really huge, important data set, I'll, I'll say it can have more space in the literature. If it's just something small with limited methods, it can get published, but it should be a much shorter paper. And then you should kind of go through each section of the peer uh, of the paper. This is what I'll do is kind of go through each section and give specific comments on each section. So I'll read the introduction, for example. Remember, the in introduction should be sufficiently succinct. So that's a comment. If it's not sufficiently succinct, I'll point that out. Uh, introduction should roughly follow what's known, what's unknown, and then the specific research question or, or hypothesis. I'm looking for that. If I don't find that, I might comment on that. Uh, authors should give a clear statement of the hypotheses or aims of the study. So if that's not there, I might recommend that be added. Uh, I'll look for whether or not there's detailed information about what was done that should be put in the methods or about what was found that really belongs in the results. Uh, another common criticism I might have in the introduction section is sometimes there's a lot of distracting information about previous studies or mechanisms that's not really directly relevant to the hypothesis being tested. So I might recommend that they get rid of that altogether or at least move it to the discussion section. Uh, and of course, the authors are supposed to tell you what gaps in the literature they're trying to fill and why it's important that they did their study. So they, that should be there. So these are the kinds of kind of checklists I might go through. Uh, and this is where I'll find a lot of problems in the introduction section. 
then I'll look at the method section, things I'm looking for in the method section. I'm going to sort of scan this section to find answers to particular questions. So usually, you know, if it's, it's a field you're familiar with, you'll kind of know all the different techniques. I might just be scanning the method to, to answer particular questions about how the data were collected, things that I think might be the major limitations of the paper. I'm going to ask myself, you know, were things measured subjectively or objectively? Could biases have creeped in? Are there f major flaws in the study design, like no control group? Um, I'm going to read the statistics section carefully because that's the other thing that I, I teach is statistics, so I tend to focus a lot on the statistics. Were those done correctly? Then I'll look through the results uh, section carefully. I'll read this section with the tables and figures right in front of me because the results section should really dovetail from the tables and figures. So each section of the results should kind of roughly correspond to one table or figure. If that's not the case, if it's hard to follow the results, I might comment on that. Um, remember, the results section is supposed to just summarize the main trends and theme and, and not repeat the data that's in the table. So if that's the case, if they're repeating a lot of the data, I might comment on that. Um, if there are graphs, it's nice if the authors give some precise numerical values in the text if they don't appear on the graphs. Uh, do the authors, are they honest in, in, uh, in their description of what's in the tables and the figures, or do they try to just draw your eye to what they want you to see? have the authors, I'll ask myself whether or not the authors have overinterpreted statistical significance or kind of overinterpreted their results. Uh, if the section is unnecessarily long, I might comment on that. And then I'll go through each table and figure. I I'm looking to see whether or not the authors use the correct statistics. Um, sometimes there are multiple tables or figures that tell the same story. That's repetitive. I'll suggest that they cut one of those. Um, I'm looking for any evidence that they're kind of, that they maybe purposefully omitted some data that doesn't support their hypothesis. I'm trying to slew that out a little bit. I look for any, if any of the graphs are misleading. Um, I make sure that the treatment group is always compared with the control group. Sometimes people try to, you know, tell you something about within group changes rather than comparing the treatment to the proper control group. So I'm looking for that. I'm looking for inconsistencies. Sometimes you'll see inconsistencies in the data they present in one table and the figure they present. I, I've caught a lot of inconsistencies in tables and figures. Um, a, a common inconsistency consistency that occurs in papers, I'm not exactly sure why, but authors often make transcribing errors when going from the data in the tables and the results section to the abstract. That is, the abstract will have incorrect numbers, and I'm not sure if that's a cutting and pasting error, or if sometimes maybe authors are working off an old abstract, maybe that they presented at a conference and they forget to update some information. But pay attention for that, because that's a common uh, error that I see, is that the, the wrong numbers are appearing in the abstract, and obviously you want to make sure that the authors correct that. Uh, and then I'll look through the discussion a section carefully. Uh, the kinds of things I might point out is, uh, you know, the first paragraph is supposed to succinctly and clearly tell you what was found and what was new in the study. And if they don't tell me that, I'll uh, suggest they rework their discussion a little bit. Again, I'm looking to see whether or not the author's conclusions are justified or if they're overreaching. And that might be a common comment I give is that they're overreaching from their data. I'm looking that they distinguish between the things that they were, you know, set out to test in their study and anything that's exploratory. I'm again looking for that clear writing, clear and to the point writing, the active voice, uh, some sense of order. So if there's poor writing in the discussion section, if it's organized poorly, if I can't follow it, I might comment on that. Uh, oftentimes I'll suggest that the discussion be shortened actually. And I'm always looking carefully at the limitation section. I want to see that they address the limitations that I care about. This is the mark of a good paper for me. If, if an author kind of anticipates what I think the limitations are and tries to address them, rather than just kind of throwing in those boilerplate uh, limitations. So I'm looking for a good limitation section. You want to see, make sure the references that they cite are current. Um, and, you know, of course, if there's any key references that you've noticed that they've omitted, you, you might comment on that. So those are kinds of the specific things in each section that I'm looking for and that I might comment on for the authors. So then I'm going to write up my peer review. I'm kind of taking notes as I go along, starting to type out these comments. Uh, what you're providing in your peer review, the content is you're going to provide a set of comments to the authors. So you want to start that set of comments with a one paragraph sort of general overview, and then you're going to go into the specifics, uh, the specific comments. So start with a one paragraph general overview. So the first thing you want to do is you want to state what you think is the major finding and importance of the work. So restate what is probably something obvious, hopefully it's obvious, but state what you think is the major finding and significance of that work. So kind of a one sentence statement. 
and then jump into those positive, encouraging statements about the work. So whenever you're criticizing somebody, you always want to start with a positive. There's always positive things. So even if there's problems in the methods, maybe they did a really jo nice job in the writing. I'll often point out when something is well written because I really appreciate good writing. Um, sometimes the research question itself is really interesting or novel. So, you know, point that out. Uh, this is an interesting manuscript with several strengths. The author should be commended for. The finding of X is important. Give them some positive encouraging words. Because um, you don't want to forget that, you know, again, we get so bogged down in pointing out the negatives, sometimes we forget that there are, there's a lot of good qualities in these papers too, and we don't just want to be focused on the negative. So give those positive uh, statements out front. Then state what you think are the one or two major limitations. If there are any, usually there are, um, but especially if you're suggesting that the paper go through major revision or even that it be rejected, you certainly want to give a kind of big picture statement of what the major limitations are in one or two sentences. So, um, you know, these are big, the big things, like the study is limited because there's no control group. That's a major methodological flaw. Or the overall writing or presentation needs improvement if there's a lot of problems in the writing. The authors may have overstated their findings. The, the paper provides only weak evidence for its conclusions. The study's exploratory, and things like that. See, these are kind of major problems. You're going to break those down in your specific comments in a minute, but this is just to open up your review. Um, you're not supposed to tell the authors in your comments to them what your recommendation is. So don't say you're recommending it for rejection or acceptance. That, that's not supposed to be disclosed to the authors in these comments. So then you're going to give you're going to start with that first paragraph and then you're going to give a numbered list of specific criticisms. And they're going to kind of illustrate, so you, you've given an overview of the criticisms, now you're going to go into the specifics. I usually give somewhere between 5 to 15 specific criticisms. If I'm saying that something should be rejected, it might just be that I have some very major criticisms on the, on the methods or just the writing is so poor. So I may have fewer comments for a paper that I'm suggesting being rejected. Similarly, if I, if I think it's really great and I want it to be accepted, I might just have, I might have fewer uh, critiques for them as well. But if I'm suggesting that something uh, come back for a major revision, I'm probably going to put more specific criticisms and suggestions telling the author how I think it should be revised. So you're probably going to give more if you're recommending that opportunity for revision, that major revision category. So make sure you number them and you're very specific in your, in your comments. So you want to point out specific mistakes. You're going to list all those issues that we just went through and you, that you found in your review uh, and give very specific recommendations for revision. Um, other than in that opening paragraph, you don't want to be too general because general things aren't helpful to the author. It's very hard for them to address if you're too general. So be extremely specific in what it is you're hoping that they will uh, change in their revision. Uh, the one thing I want to mention is, is reviewer is not the same as copy editor. So uh, if you've got a paper where there's a lot of like grammatical and spelling errors, it's not your job as a peer reviewer to be a copy editor for that paper. So don't waste your time you know, picking out every single grammar and spelling issue and pointing all of those out to the, um, to the author. I sometimes see peer reviewers uh, who will spend, you know, just an inordinate amount of time on all of these little mistakes. And, and that's really not the job of the peer reviewer. The, the journals have copy editors who will go through and fix those kinds of things later. So um, don't spend your time on those little things. Focus on the big picture issues of the paper, whether or not it should be published. In, unless the grammar is, if, if the grammar is so terrible that you can't read it, you can point that out in a general way. So, um, you know, give one or two examples. So the manuscript contains a lot of typos. Let me give you two examples. You, you can say it in a general way. You don't have to point out every, uh, every specific typo. So, so that's the one thing I'd caution is don't spend a lot of time doing copy editing things. Uh, now, you're also going to provide, in addition to the comments to the author, you're going to provide some comments to the editors, and the authors uh, won't see these. So uh, sometimes the editors will ask you to fill out some kind of grading sheet. Not all journals have this, but a lot of them do. Uh, I'll show you an example of that in a minute. So if that's there, you're going to fill that out. You're going to choose your recommendation. So you get to uh, advise the editors whether you think the paper should be rejected outright, rejected with the opportunity to revise, that's that major revision category, accepted with minor revisions, or just accepted outright. And you're going to pick that based on how you know strong you think the paper is and whether or not you think it can be publishable after a major revision. So you give a recommendation to the editor. Uh, they will factor that in in their final decision. 
And then you'll also have a space um, to give uh, comments to the editor that, you're, that the authors won't see. Now you, you can feel free to leave that space empty, but sometimes it's nice to give just a, a succinct overall statement to the editors that justifies your ranking. Like, I, I don't think this paper is going to be publishable even after a major review. You can be a little bit frank here uh, where you're trying to keep the tone nice with the authors. Um, you can be a little bit more frank here as to what you think of the paper or if there's very specific concerns you have. Um, if there are you know, ethical concerns you have with the paper, you might address those there. So sort of more touchy issues or just being frank, you can address those uh, in that space and those will only go to the editors. Here's an example of a grading sheet that you might see for a journal. So they have sometimes will have things like, well, the impact of the research rate the, the paper, is it in the top 10%, is it in the bottom 50%? They have these kind of grading schemes. Now, sometimes it feels like when you're filling these out, they're a little bit arbitrary. So my general recommendation is just be internally consistent. That is, you know, from your from one review to the next that you do, you want your ratings to generally be consistent. So a paper so that you know if you were to rank all the papers that you know the ones that you think are really good are you gonna get a high ranking on this uh, grading system and the ones that you don't like as much are gonna get a lower rating. It, it's you know from it, it may vary from reviewer to reviewer exactly how you uh, fill in this grading sheet. But the grading sheet just helps uh, you to kind of make a decision uh, about whether or not you think the paper should be accepted. Because if you're rating all of these categories, they'll go through like the impact of the research, the writing quality, that's usually a category, the methodology, the data quality, the originality of the results. It'll give you all of these things. And if you find yourself checking off that, you know, the paper did poorly on a lot of things that might uh, lead you to say, well, oh, maybe this isn't a paper that I think um, should be published. Or if you're checking off a lot of high scores for a paper, you might then decide that it should be uh, accepted. So it can help kind of guide your recommendation. It also serves as a checklist, and I think this is one of the reasons that, that um, a lot of journals have it. It serves as a checklist for the peer reviewer. So it's kind of a, a checklist you can go through, especially when you're doing your first couple of peer reviews, and make sure, did I consider data quality? Did I, did I think about each of these aspects of the paper? So in a way, it, it's probably Probably primary importance is to serve as a checklist for the peer reviewers to make sure they've thought about each of these elements of the paper. And usually you're asked to give some kind of overall manuscript rank and that's likely to correspond. You know, if you give it a high rank, you're probably saying it should be accepted. If you give it a low rank, you're probably saying it should be rejected or at least rejected uh, with the opportunity to revise. So, uh, so that's the basic process of doing a peer review. Uh, my final comments on it are, uh, the first one you do will take you a really long time. I think I spent like a day on the first peer review that I ever did. Uh, so this is again why journal editors love young peer reviewers because you're going to feel this enormous responsibility on your first review and you're going to be extremely thorough and extremely careful. Uh, and so that's great. Um, you will get faster because if you, ha if you had to take a day on every peer review you had to do, you would never get any work done. So, um, so you will get progressively faster as you do more and more of these. Um, and now it takes me a, a much shorter time. I think the last one I did, you know, I spent just over an hour on. So I can, I, I've now streamlined my process and, and you can do these really quickly. The one thing to caution, of course, is that as you do more and more of these and you get faster and faster, you have to make sure that you're still being sufficiently careful. Um, so you will get faster as you go along. Again, you will learn a lot from these. And my final parting thought on this is just to review unto others as you would want to be reviewed. So, you know, be kind, uh, be positive, make sure you pay attention to the tone. And sometimes, uh, as you get faster in doing these, I've noticed for myself when I'm doing these quickly, uh, the, the tone often comes out a lot more negative just because I'm writing things very quickly. And I have to go back and just make sure I look over and edit it and make sure it sounds uh, positive in the end. So make sure you take that final step and do that because it's very important um, for the author on the other end. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University please visit us at med.stanford.edu.